By the 1940s, the forces that fought the Battle of Jutland were mostly gone. The High Seas Fleet was scrapped or resting at the bottom of Scapa Flow. And the Grand Fleet, Britain's pride and joy, only the Queen Elizabeth's and a couple revenges remained of the capital ships at Jutland. In active service, of course. The flagship of that climactic battle, HMS Iron Duke, remained in British inventory, even as the Second World War raged across the globe. This old dreadnought endured, admittedly demilitarized and run aground, but still there. While no longer an active combatant, Iron Duke would survive two world wars, before being towed away for a quiet scrapping soon after. Let's look at the story of how she got there in this video, beginning with a brief description of how her design came about as the nameship of her class. The origin of the Iron Duke class can be tied directly to the ongoing naval arms race between Britain and Germany. This was a time where speed of construction was as important as technological innovation, as the Royal Navy strove to maintain its lead on the Germans. This required a large number of ships, with each year's allocation of funding. In the case of 1911, the British looked to build four dreadnoughts. In the interests of saving money and time, these ships would be a repeat of the previous design for the most part. That being the King George V class. No, not that King George V class. The main difference between the older dreadnoughts and Iron Duke was in the secondary battery. It was in Iron Duke that the British made the jump from 4-inch, 102mm guns, to larger 6-inch, 152mm weapons. The smaller number of barrels and the slower rate of fire were seen as acceptable sacrifices, in the interest of heavier-hitting shells to deal with growing torpedo boats, as well as doing more damage to enemy capital ships. As for the other changes in order, Iron Duke displaced about 2,000 more tons than King George V. Iron Duke could displace up to 30,000 tons at full load, compared to around 28,000 tons on King George V. Another change came to the weaponry as well, with the addition of a fourth submerged torpedo tube, which was of dubious value, but it was a common practice at the time. The side and deck armor were rearranged a bit, while the protection of the secondary battery was increased, from 3.5 inches to 6 inches at its thickest. It was, during the design process, assumed that all of this would result in a slower speed, about a half a knot less in comparison to the prior design. As it turned out, Iron Duke retained more or less the same top speed. The only other notable change was a lower freeboard and overall finer lines from a slightly longer ship. With the changes in design covered, I'll give the details real quick before moving on to service history. As previously mentioned, Iron Duke displaced around 30,000 tons at her full loading. Her standard load was more like 25,000 to 26,000 tons. On that displacement, the ship carried the same 10 13.5 inch 343mm guns that had been arming Royal Navy dreadnoughts since HMS Orion, in more or less the same layout as well. Five twin turrets with a pair super firing on the bow and another super-firing pair on the stern. The fifth turret, meanwhile, was carried amidships behind the second funnel. These were supported by the aforementioned 6-inch guns. Iron Duke carried 12 such weapons in single casement mountings, six to a side. Most were clustered up front around the superstructure. Two of the mountings were, however, in the stern, very low in the stern, as seen here. As could be expected, those two were unusable in anything but a flat calm. They would later be removed and relocated to deck mountings. To round off the weaponry, Iron Duke carried two 3-inch anti-aircraft guns to mildly inconvenience any potential attackers, as well as four 3-pounder guns and the previously mentioned four submerged torpedo tubes. As for defense, the ship was protected by a main belt of 12 inches at its thickest, this lower towards 4 inches as it approached the bow and stern, while the deck armor was a decent, for the time, 2.5 inches in thickness. All of this was pushed through the water at around 21 knots by 29,000 shaft horsepower through four shafts. 
And with that done, we can move on to Iron Duke's actual career. The ship that would become HMS Iron Duke was laid down on January 12th, 1912 in Portsmouth and launched on October 12th of the same year, which is still a frankly absurd construction time. The fitting out process, by contrast, was far more typical. It took until March 1914 for the battleship to be commissioned, although her sea trials actually began in November of 1913. Now, if you know your history, you probably know where this is going. March of 1914 was only a couple months before the Great War broke out in late July of 1914. Iron Duke, as a result, was almost immediately thrown into war after she joined the fleet. No early peacetime service for this ship. When the home fleet was reorganized into the Grand Fleet, Iron Duke assumed flagship duties. This was an important role, to be sure, but it didn't mean much difference in the grand scheme of things. For much of the Great War, Iron Duke would follow the same path as most British dreadnoughts, sitting in port with the odd sortie to try and chase the Germans down, as well as training, mine-laying operations, and supporting the blockade of Germany. It's rather telling that even Bert, who normally makes a point of breaking down a ship's service history, jumps straight to Jutland, beyond a cursory mention of Iron Duke's role as fleet flagship. This isn't surprising. While the battlecruisers were chasing their German counterparts across the North Sea, the Grand Fleet would sortie to support. But outside of maybe the Queen Elizabeth, the British battleships weren't fast enough for more than that. So when you had the Germans bombard the British coast in 1914, you could see Iron Duke lead the fleet out to chase them, but it would come to nothing, because the Germans always slipped away and battles like Heligoland Bight in 1914 or Dogger Bank in 1915 were fought by lighter and faster forces, even though the Grand Fleet sortied as distant support for the battlecruisers during Dogger Bank. Beyond that, 1915 would follow much the same pattern as 1914 had. Quiet support operations, with training and the odd refit breaking up the monotony. Some British battleships would see excitement off Gallipoli, but Iron Duke was not one of those. She remained with the Grand Fleet as flagship and missed much of the action as a result. About the only real difference between her career and most other battleships was related to the flagship duties. Iron Duke would, at various points, transport Jellicoe to other parts of Britain for meetings. On May 25, 1915, Iron Duke carried Jellicoe to meet Henry Jackson, the new first sea lord. And then on August 7th, another meeting came, this time with the Prime Minister, Herbert Asquith. Other than this, not much of note for 1915. 1916, on the other hand, would be far more exciting, even if it began in less than ideal fashion. On January 12th, 1916, Iron Duke collided with a tanker. This ship, Prudentia, had broken her mooring lines during a gale. Considering the winds were up to 80 miles per hour, or 130 kilometers per hour, that's not really surprising. However, in similar fashion to HMS Campania, a couple years later, this ended in a sunken ship. Prudentia slammed into Iron Duke, and sank soon after. The battleship, for her part, was undamaged. The next bit of excitement came on the night of March 25th, when British forces launched a raid on the German Zeppelin base at Tondern. This would not be as successful as the later raid, featuring HMS Furious. In fact, by the time the Grand Fleet joined up with the battlecruisers, severe weather had once more picked up. The British returned home, with Iron Duke shepherding some destroyers back to Scapa Flow. After this, and the raid on Lowestoft, not much happened. Until, that is, May of 1916. Specifically, the very end of May. May 31st, 1916. The Battle of Jutland. As is common with capital ships in World War I, this was THE big action, where all the training and patrolling finally paid off. However, as the flagship of the Grand Fleet, Iron Duke missed the early stages of the battle. While the battlecruisers and Queen Elizabeth pounded away at each other, the Grand Fleet waited. Iron Duke, in particular, sailed with the 4th Battle Squadron as the ninth ship in the line. 
It wouldn't be until 6 p.m. that the Grand Fleet joined the fray. Iron Duke was one of the first ships engaged at that point, with two shells falling nearby around 6.14. Fifteen minutes later, the flagship brought her own guns to bear on the Germans. In the ensuing brawl, Iron Duke would prove to be one of the more accurate British ships in this battle. Jellicoe trained his crew well. Iron Duke claimed no fewer than six hits on a German dreadnought, SMS Koenig. In reality, the crew underreported their hits. They actually hit the German ship seven times after the first salvo fell short. Most of the time, you'll see ships overclaim on their actions. Iron Duke is the rare exception here, at least according to Campbell. Burt only counts the six hits that Iron Duke claimed. He also notes Iron Duke is engaging another German battleship, as well as a battlecruiser. However, Burt doesn't specify which ships she engaged. As the battle progressed, Iron Duke shifted her fire from capital ships to the lighter forces. Around 7 p.m., her guns opened up on the crippled cruiser SMS Wiesbaden. That unfortunate punching bag of the Grand Fleet was fired on by multiple British ships. Iron Duke's fire at the cruiser and nearby destroyers was largely ineffective. Her crew went from underclaiming her hits to overclaiming them here. The British gunners claimed to sink a destroyer and hit another, but they actually missed entirely. That said, SMS S-35, another destroyer, was probably sunk by Iron Duke, when the Germans made a torpedo run around 7.25 p.m. With the general chaos of that battle, this remains a probably because it's difficult to say for sure which ship sank the destroyer. At this point, Iron Duke's role in the battle came to an end. The High Seas Fleet broke off in the gathering darkness, and the Grand Fleet didn't pursue, not until it was too late. At that point, the Battle of Jutland, the largest naval action of the war, came to an end. Over the course of the battle, Iron Duke fired 90 rounds from her 13.5-inch guns and 50 from her 6-inch secondaries. She heavily damaged a battleship, probably sank a destroyer, and came out with no damage of her own. However, this was Iron Duke's big moment. As with most capital ships, the rest of the Great War passed quietly. An attempt to engage the High Seas Fleet on August 19th of 1916 only ended in submarines having a field day. Two British cruisers were sunk by U-boats, and a German battleship was damaged by a British submarine. Jellicoe promptly forbade any sorties to the southern part of the North Sea, unless it could guarantee a chance to catch the High Seas Fleet. This would be his last notable order in command of the Grand Fleet. Iron Duke went into dry dock in October of 1916. This was part of a rolling process where the Grand Fleet had additional deck armor installed. Iron Duke received 100 tons of extra armor, added between October and December. During this, on November 28, 1916, BT replaced Jellico. This did not go over well, apparently. Iron Duke's crew rather liked Jellico, and considering his replacement being who he was, I can definitely believe there was some friction there. In any case, the Admiral shifted his flag to HMS Queen Elizabeth, in January 1917. Now stripped of her role, Iron Duke saw out the rest of the war without major incident. Her post-war career, on the other hand, would prove more interesting. In March of 1919, Iron Duke shifted to the Mediterranean fleet, where she became flagship once more. Of a different fleet, admittedly, but still flagship. While serving in that area, Iron Duke would spend a good deal of time off the Turkish coast or in the Black Sea. She was part of the Allied fleet, keeping an eye on both the Russian Civil War and the conflict between Greece and Turkey. While her guns saw no use in this, the ship was kept busy sailing around. Had it become necessary, her guns would have been more than capable of dealing with anything in the area. As it turned out, she didn't need to. The most exciting moment came not from a duel at sea, but from rescuing refugees. In late 1922, the Greco-Turkish War was coming to an end. One of the last tragedies of that conflict came in September. The Great Fire of Smyrna from September 13th through the 22nd of 1922. I'm not going to go into who has responsibility for that blaze because it's a contentious topic and not relevant to the video. 
What is relevant is that Iron Duke, on a training cruise at the time, was called to the port. She arrived in early September to keep an eye on the situation, and the battleship would be present during the fire. Iron Duke can be seen here, with the city burning in the background. While the city burned, Greek and Armenian refugees fled by boat. Quite a few of them found their way to Iron Duke, trying to escape the flames. They weren't turned away to the credit of Iron Duke's crew. That said, after the fire burned out, Iron Duke would leave the area. She was the site of a conference to mediate between Greece and Turkey in October of 1922. Then the ship left. For the rest of the 1920s, the ship would bounce around the Mediterranean. She was relieved as flagship by Queen Elizabeth for a second time in November of 1924. And by 1926, the ship was on training duty. Iron Duke and her sisters were the oldest battleships retained under the Washington Treaty. Her shifting to a training role isn't surprising. In fact, by 1929, the ship was reduced to a gunnery training ship. And in 1931, under the London Naval Treaty, the old warhorse was disarmed and turned into a full-time training ship. Two turrets were removed, along with much of her armor. Smaller guns and rangefinders were put aboard to serve her new role. In this role, Iron Duke would see out the 1930s, including a fleet review in July 1935, and the coronation review for King George VI on May 20th, 1937. By World War II, however, Iron Duke was terribly outdated. There were idle suggestions of refitting the ship when the British were truly desperate for anything they could get. Anything from returning the old guns to putting new 14-inch weapons in their place. None of these plans went anywhere because it would have been too expensive, for a result of questionable utility. Instead, Iron Duke was moored in Scapa Flow. The ship was attacked there on October 17th, 1939. Four Junkers Ju-88 bombers attacked the base, and Iron Duke was damaged by several near misses. The ship, never designed for that kind of attack, had to be run aground to prevent her from sinking. Not that it saved her from further attack. On March 16th of 1940, another raid hit Scapa Flow. Iron Duke was hit again and further damaged. Eventually, that damage was repaired, though the ship remained beached. At that point, Iron Duke was used as a harbor ship for the rest of the war. She wasn't damaged again, and wasn't used as a block ship like her fellow Great War veteran, HMS Centurion. No, Iron Duke would see out the Second World War. The ship wasn't removed from the Royal Navy inventory until March of 1946, when she was sold for scrapping. This process began in 1948, bringing an end to a long career. Maybe not the most eventful one, but still a career worth looking at. From the flagship at Jutland, to the fire of Smyrna, to the German air attack in the Second World War. Iron Duke saw quite a bit during her 30-odd years of service. As a final note, some sources will make the claim that Admiral Luchens took Iron Duke and a couple decoy battleships in Scapa Flow as active warships and it shaped his decision to make for the Denmark Strait when breaking out into the Atlantic aboard Bismarck. That may or may not be true. It does, of course, make for a good story. Thank you for watching. Remember to like, comment, and subscribe if you enjoy the content, and I'll see you in the next one.